Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. Except I have to take that last title away today. I'm not really the monster expert. Not when I'm compared to my guest today, Joseph Nigg. If you know anything about him or his many books on fabulous beasts, then you know what I know and have known for many years, that he's the real monster professor around here. At least I've thought so, and many others have as well. Um, He's an expert who has book after book after book on fabulous beasts. In fact, his book titled The Book of Fabulous Beasts, Beasts, uh, 1999 out of Oxford University Press. That's the one that first really drew my eye to him. I, um, in in this in this collection of source materials, everything from the uh, ancient Babylonian uh, Enuma Elish all the way up to the mo- to uh, modern writers on um, uh, tracks the history of fabulous beasts like the dragon, the phoenix, the griffin, the unicorn, and this is a guy who really gets it. And then the more I looked up into him uh, and saw his other works, the more that was absolutely proved true. And so I'll try to give you a quick rundown of his many books. He's got uh, The Phoenix, an unnatural biography of a mythical of a mythical beast, University of Chicago Press. That one's not too long ago. Uh, sea Monsters, a voyage around the world's most beguiling map, University of Chicago Press. How to Raise and Keep Keep a Dragon, for those of you who wanting to know that, uh, 2013, Book of Dragons and Other Mythical Beasts. Um, I've mentioned Book of Fabulous Beasts, which is close to my heart and had a huge influence on me. Wonder Beasts, uh, back in 95, A Guide to Imaginary Birds of the World, uh, The Book of Griffins. Um, these are only his books. He's done many other things as well. Uh, he holds a PhD from University of Denver, MFA from Iowa Writers Workshop, Kent State for his BA. The man is brilliant and he was extremely generous to sit down and talk with me about Fabulous Beasts. I really enjoyed this conversation with him and as I said, it's a great honor and a great pleasure to do so and to get to share that with you. So without further ado, here is my conversation with the great Joseph Nigg. Uh, wow. Well, this is a real pleasure for me uh, to talk to another follower uh, of imaginary <laughs> creatures. Uh, had a mind-blowing couple of days uh, re- reading uh, your podcasts. Uh, wow, Josh, uh, what a discovery for me uh, with um, uh, your... Um, uh, which ones are they? I, I'm, I'm checking my notes. I, I'm an old guy here. Uh, and uh, uh, Monsters in Lit uh, blows me away. Uh, uh, you are so you have such great scope uh, and depth. Uh, and I was realizing that, my God, OK, the book you like so much of mine, I do, too. Uh, for, for me, it is a source book, uh, and, uh, it's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what you do, uh, is you go sliding down the doggone glacier, uh, <laughs> which is wonderful. And, and I am happy that it's a source book. Uh, it's a source book for me too, uh, all the time uh, to go back to and, uh, uh, read things that I, I've forgotten, um, the actual uh, line or something, which I did this morning. I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. Uh, one of my favorite lines of all time. Uh, do you know where it's from? I'm a brother to dragons. Um, that is... 
That is, is that from Job? Yes, it is. Yes, all right. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and your discussion uh, of uh, Leviathan and Behemoth is, is just wonderful. Uh, I love it. Uh, and, um, uh, and so that gets me back to Job. Yeah, Job, uh, the most poetic, really. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, of the Old Testament and, and most loved by, uh, English majors, uh, <laughs> and literary folk. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that description, uh, of Leviathan especially, uh, is just like, uh, what you have in, uh, Revelation, uh, just so, uh, dreamlike, uh, and, and wonderful stuff. Um, Oh boy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, it really is. Um, and, and we're, and we're diving into the deep end, uh, almost literally. <laughs> we're getting into Leviathan, which is exactly where I'd want to go to. Uh, but first of all, thank, <laughs> thank you so much for the kind words. I, I know you can't see me right now. Neither can the listeners, but I'm blushing over here <laughs> because I have to say it's a, it's a huge honor and a huge pleasure to get to talk with you. Um, there are, uh, you know, I, on the podcast, I, I rather cheekily call myself a monster expert, or I just went with the name The Monster Professor, and others have poked fun at me a little bit in the past saying, like, what right do you have to call yourself The Monster Professor? <laughs> and, the, and the truth is, as long as you are around, I really have none, because you are the real Monster Professor in my mind, and, and you have the books to prove prove it one book after another and and the book that that made the largest impact on me one that came out in 1999 i believe was um book of fabulous beasts a treasury of writings from ancient times to the present and I realized that wasn't the first time I knew of you. I used to watch this show in the 90s, hosted by Leonard Nimoy on A&E. And it was, um, it was, uh, what was it? Mystery, ancient mysteries. <laughs> and, and there was a special episode on dragons, which I remember blowing my mind. Um, uh, and you were on there as one of the experts, right? Was that, is that yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I prepared for it, uh, with about, uh, a 15, uh, uh, single space page of answers to the questions they were, uh, asking me, uh, and, uh, and I, I got into it, uh, with the interviewer and, and she realized, no, just talk to me as though I am, uh, your granddaughter, uh, and, uh, oh, hey, I, I'm having real trouble here with, with uh, Tiamat and uh, <laughs> Art, uh, uh, and uh, and and I was de- so dependent uh, on what I had uh, written uh, that um, I was really having trouble, and they cut uh, oh 99 percent of the doggone thing. <laughs> <laughs> And I did get a, a couple of uh, lines in it, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was very professorial, uh, uh, sitting next to the fireplace uh, with, with the, the tweed jacket and, and yeah, all that. Books behind uh, and you and everything. So yesterday, yesterday uh, preparing for this, um, I, I looked at your questions and, uh, and said, hey, Nick, don't do what the heck you did before. Uh, uh, don't write it all out. Let, let yourself go. And if you screw up, uh, you, you do somewhere or other. If you take off too far, too many trains going in too many directions, um, okay, that, that's fine. Uh, uh, Josh is a young guy. He's forgiving. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Let's, let's, let's do it this way. 
Well, um, it's and it's that you bring up too many trains going in too different, too many different directions. Not only do I, I, I feel like at, at one point or another, I started worrying that that was uh, that was a big flaw of mine. I would get so excited about the monster of the episode that I would just go, get, jump all over the place, and then I find out listeners are as forgiving to me as I am as a listener to other people. They just like hearing, hearing about monsters too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It is so good to talk to another impassioned follower uh, of these imaginary creatures. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, and as a, as a writer to have somebody read one of your doggone books is astounding. <laughs> it's, it's just wonderful. Yeah, you sit up here in the scriptorium, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're so far out of the world. Uh, and, uh, and it's very nice when there's another voice out there <laughs> from a different uh, island <laughs> yeah yeah it really is a pleasure to get to to hear from somebody and i and just to let the listeners know a little bit more like one reason you you had such a big impact on me and and you're a, you're a hero in in my mind is this this book fabulous beasts is is unlike any other accomplishment that I know of altogether in one book. It, it essentially it tracks the primary the source material of fabulous beasts, starting with, as far as I know, the very earliest pieces of coherent writing that weren't just like like grain inventories in Mesopotamia, the, you know, the Enuma Elish starting there and going all the way to modern writers tracking some of the most significant, uh, fabulous beast dragons, uh, griffins, unicorn, the Phoenix. And all, and so it's just a, it's a fantastic treasury. And that's just one of your many, many books. And so one question I've got to know is what, got you into fabulous beasts so much where did your love and obsession uh for this come from uh they have enriched my life uh for the last uh uh 40 years <laughs> um way back i started uh, as a uh, um in high school sports writing <laughs> and, and got a, a small scholarship to kent state uh uh, uh, and was in journalism. Um, at the uh, end of my junior year, I uh, rather lost my head after reading the Iliad and changed my major <laughs> to uh, English. Uh, I had it in a best, uh, you know, uh, masterpieces of the literature uh, course. Uh, and, uh, my father almost disowned me. How <laughs> in the world are you going to make a living? Uh, and, uh, the head of the department, uh, journalism department forgave me. I was due to be editor of the Kent Stater next year. Uh, and, uh, and so, okay. I, I, I read the Iliad, uh, the, uh, and, and Dante's, uh, uh, all his commedia in that course, uh, and, uh, uh, part of Don Quixote, uh, and, and so I lost my head. Uh, and, uh, when I went, uh, for a recommendation to the head of the English department, uh, he, he said, uh, no, I will not give you one. You changed your major. Uh, well, yeah, he wouldn't. Uh, I think the journalism guy did. Uh, but uh, the English uh, uh, head of the English department said, how many courses have you had in Alexander Pope? Uh, and I said, well, I had one. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and Whitman was important to me uh, a, a lot uh, uh, in, in American lit. Anyway, got accepted at uh, the workshop, squeezed in the workshop at Iowa uh, and uh, Started a, uh, a novel there that I'd been making notes about for some time of a guy following a fantasy, following uh, a spirit uh, of his deceased wife uh, to another world. Um, and then that that changed. I got several chapters into it. Um, 
with a wonderful professor, uh, George P. Elliott. Um, uh, later, I, w- I went into a, a realistic fiction. Uh, well, with wonderful Vance Perjali, he was great. Uh, with uh, Philip Roth, uh, who finally left uh, without giving me a grade, uh, <laughs> went back to Berjali again, uh, and uh, and then like the next uh, a couple of years after, I was um, swimming uh, at late uh, late afternoon, early evening in uh, Lake Huron uh, off uh, Bay City. Michigan, where my parents lived, uh, and the seagull comes down, uh, and is just, just floating, bobbing in front of me, uh, and, and I s- slowly swim after it a little, uh, with, with the breaststroke, uh, and, and it just kept bobbing and bobbing and bobbing, uh, and, so I went back to my fantasy, but changed it uh, to a quest for a bird, and it happened to be a firebird. Uh, and the first chapter, of, uh, that took me through most of my 20s writing that. Uh, and I had um, Odysseus, uh, Don Quixote, Jack London, uh, and uh, a, a modern everyman, Going in the quest of this firebird, uh, in a ship that they, uh, build from the, the constellation Argo, uh, and, uh, sail it off the edge of the world, uh, and, uh, and I thought this is going to make me famous. Uh, well, it, it, it uh, is in a drawer somewhere up here, uh, and, uh, after many, many, uh, rejections, but the first chapter uh, is in um, on my website. It's called uh, Bird of Wonder, uh, and that was rewritten several times. Uh, and uh, uh, it's it's at the back uh, of my website. Uh, uh, wonderful uh, Jeff um, Vandermeer uh, liked it and used it as the introduction to his Leviathan series. Uh, way back in 95, uh, and he's been a great supporter ever since. Uh, and, uh, the latest is his wife's, uh, collection called Bestiary. Uh, and in that, uh, uh my wife, uh, Esther and I collaborated, uh, in a, a wild, wild thing called, uh, the Jason Bug. Uh, so. Uh, Vandermeer and, and your stuff, um, uh, the, the wonderful story of yours, uh, of the uh, fight with the monsters. Uh, oh God, uh, that is just like Vandermeer stuff. Uh, and I wonder if you know him or if you've dealt with him or if you've been in any of his anthologies, uh, because you, you, yeah, you're obviously of that quality, uh, and uh, my goodness, he's very famous now. You know, his, his first uh, movie, Annihilation, just came out uh, several months ago. Yeah, uh, trilogy. And yeah, it's oh, funny. What, it's what you know of Jeff. What do you, uh, <laughs> Jeff or Anne? And yeah, it's it's funny. It's funny that you mention him because he's on my list of people that I hope to invite on the show one day. And I didn't realize <laughs> you two had a connection there. Um, oh. And and I've 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 sung his praises uh, in many episodes before. Um, for his book Annihilation blew my mind. It's fantastic. In fact, <laughs> we go. In fact, I I um I did one episode on botanical monsters, and I and I dedicate a large portion of that to him and. Uh, uh, yeah, and then once I heard uh, he was he was getting to team up with Alex Garland for the film version of Annihilation. Alex Garland, I consider to be perhaps one of the best screenwriters of our generation, um, and so he, and so I I have a fair bit of uh, hero worship uh, for both of those actually, <laughs> but oh, I've never got to meet him yeah. or anything. Son of a gun! Oh, oh okay, uh, Josh. Uh, uh, not showing me at all, right? Right. If that's true, and it's only a um, 
only audio, um, uh, I would love to uh, uh, light up a pipe, if that's okay. Tolkien <laughs> often did it while he was uh, being uh, interviewed. Oh, and, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hey, thanks. Uh, I, I'm addicted. Uh, there is no, and have been, God, since my late teens. And uh, no, I actually, I actually really like the idea of, of imagining getting to talk to Joseph Nig while he's smoking a pipe. This is just a magical. <laughs> this is a magical <laughs> moment for me. <laughs> so. Um, so you mentioned you mentioned these these birds uh, featuring featuring powerfully in your imagination, and then going after this quest. And and if I'm if I'm not mistaken, you even knew the 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 one of the founding fathers of our idea of the hero's quest, Joseph Campbell. Uh, is uh, that right? Did you? Yeah, did you? yeah, I interviewed him. Uh, right, and uh, it was wonderful. Uh, uh, and, and in fact. Uh, before many years before I uh, met him, um, in the Brown Palace uh, downtown, uh, which has a, a Griffin register um, uh, up in the wall uh, for ventilation, whatever, uh, and uh, interviewed him uh, with another interviewer um, uh, sitting in the couch below the Griffin, and I gave him uh, gave him a Griffin book uh, and. Uh, and I was later in the day uh, after I went to his uh, lecture at the uh, what uh, the uh, Natural History Museum. Uh, we met uh, in the men's room, uh, and <laughs> while we were standing uh, there, uh, uh, he, he said, "Oh, hey, I really enjoyed your book." <laughs> 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 That was great. I'd given it to him earlier in the afternoon, uh, and and it was a highlight of my life. Uh, it was wow. All right, uh, and a- uh, God, uh, I um, had dreams about him uh, later, uh, and uh, uh, of um, me in, a, in the parapet of a castle uh, with, with the ocean out there uh, sparkling uh, and. He climbed up the outside with his broad brim uh, straw hat uh, and um, uh, and peeked over and um, uh, looked at me and I, I think maybe there's a telephone involved uh, too um, and so I wrote him again uh, regarding to see if he'd be uh, um, if he, if he would do a forward uh, to my imaginary birds of the world uh, and. And he had passed on by then. Oh, uh, wow. uh, and, uh, <laughs> but so, so it, it was great. Uh, and in fact, I had used, uh, his heroes of all time or, uh, uh, before you, um, from, um, Hero of a Thousand Faces as the epigraph for Mondanaire, that fantasy, uh, that, uh, that I told you about. Yeah. That well, was that was just the beginning. Um, uh, that that was the fictional beginning uh, of uh, my quest. The uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I'd been writing uh, fiction for twenty years, uh, several novels, uh, lots of short stories. Uh, got a few short stories uh, published. I was able to get an MFA at uh, at Iowa, and then. PhD at the uh, University of, uh, of Denver. Um, but I, and I was on another novel, uh, about a, an unemployed medievalist, uh, uh, who takes up residence, you know, leaves the family, uh, and goes and lives in the, uh, a, a, a ship in a children's park. <laughs> uh, and, and I did get through the uh, entire uh, uh, first draft of that. But all that time I was writing, uh, I'm looking at uh, this antique oil lamp, uh, which is behind me. I don't know if you can see it or not. 
uh, hanging right right behind me, right behind the desk. Uh, on it uh, is a uh, is embossed a figure of a winged lion with a fish or dragon tail, uh, and it's just burrowed down in my mind uh, this image over and over, uh, and then. January 1, 1980, uh, uh, my boys and I are, are with family friend uh, in their house, uh, and I'm sitting with uh, one of the daughters uh, who is reading, uh, a, who is showing me uh, a unicorn book she got for Christmas. Uh, and at that point, um, my imagination projected a griffin uh, leaping into the room and head as high as uh, the ceiling uh, and great wings. What? <laughs> uh, I, I wrote about... <laughs> I wrote about... Uh, I, no, I, I mentioned it in an interview uh, with the Rocky Mountain News. Uh, and uh, this is after the griffin book came out. Uh, and um, a, a guy comes to the door, uh, and uh, he said, oh, he saw this in uh, the Rocky Mountain News, wanted to uh, say hi. And so I invited him, uh, I gave him a glass of wine, uh, and he said, um, did you really see a griffin? <laughs> that point, I'm wondering, where is my escape? <laughs> How can I get the heck out of here? Uh, and <laughs> No, uh, it wasn't, uh, I would not call it hallucination, uh, I, but, but a very, very strong um, imaginative projection. And probably, uh, yeah, the, uh, a monster from within uh, just leaps up. Uh, and uh, I then switched uh, writing uh, from uh, uh, writing on that uh, uh, the, um, the novel uh, of, of the uh, unemployed medievalist. Um, I, I still have various versions of it, a uh, short story which was uh, so accepted a couple of times uh, and uh, uh, not printed. Um, uh, but, uh, I, I switched from that to, um, uh, researching, uh, the Griffin and, uh, did, and, uh, my wife, um, uh, now, uh, Esther, uh, had worked at the Denver Public Library, uh, excuse me, not the library, it's the museum. She was a volunteer there and knew of a Persian cup, ancient Persian cup, silver cup with a griffin uh, uh, embossed on it. Took me down uh, to the storeroom uh, and uh, they put uh, the white cotton gloves uh, on me and I held that doggone thing in my hand wow. going back like at least uh, 3,000 years. Uh, and uh, and there's a scene in um, Indiana Jones and uh, uh, the Lost Ark, uh, and uh, uh, where what is it burns into the hand of, of yeah yeah the icon uh, and, <laughs> and that got me. Uh, so I uh, researched more, started marketing, and a year later. Uh, uh, the Griffin book came out, and uh, um, and and that was that was the first. Uh, so to leap to one of your last questions, uh, which was, um, uh, what's your all-time favorite monster? Well, I have griffins all over the house, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and and in <laughs> the backyard, on the uh, outside plaque on the garage, and so on. Uh, so that led me to all the other, uh, animals and ultimately, uh, to the Phoenix. 
Uh, and uh, so I would have to answer what's your all-time favorite. Well, there are two of them. Uh, it is uh, Griffin and Phoenix. Uh, I have been following off and on oh, between full-time editorial job and I'm retired now uh, and uh, several books. Um, was the Phoenix, the book you have, uh, had an editor, uh, the, the Oxford editor, um, chose the Phoenix from a list of um, books that I had in mind that I would work with. Uh, and she chose the Phoenix because she had just been to the Venice uh, Opera House, uh, El Fenice, uh, and... Uh, uh, which had burned, you probably know, uh, several times over the centuries and, and is uh, rebuilt again and again and again, uh, most recently just uh, about a decade or so. Huh. Uh, and uh, so I started uh, The Phoenix. Uh, that was from, yeah, in 1998. Uh, so off and on between work and other books, I followed that bird uh, for uh, over 18 years, and uh, uh, and that's what I love most about these creatures uh, is following them uh, through time uh, and uh, watching the, the, their cultural transformations. Uh, all of them uh, uh, do that. Uh, uh, they, they keep changing shape and form, meaning, uh, and uh, and it's a way to see patterns. Uh, they reflect patterns of of, uh, of history and imagination, uh, and uh, and it's a wonderful way to uh, look look at history. Uh, it, it's to see how they reflect. Um, what is going on uh, in the world itself, whether from the Egyptians uh, up to uh, up through the uh, terrorist bombing um, of New York City uh, and uh, on and on and on. Um, and, and in, in fact, yeah, one. Oh, I shouldn't interrupt you. I should let you talk a minute. <laughs> well, no, it's just you, you. You hit on you hit on so many you hit on so many really deep points, and and a lot of them I was hoping to actually get your thoughts on um, there. Like when you're you're bringing up this uh, this. Uh, almost like a it seems to me like a false dichotomy like an unnecessary dichotomy of like well did you really see the griffin or did you not well of course you really <laughs> did but of course you <laughs> didn't right you know I, I, love it. I, I i love that okay you're right yeah and so you don't you don't we don't really need those and as far as i can tell uh That's people of ancient point. times didn't need the distinction either right i mean whether it was zoologically there or not it was still it still mattered uh the image of the griffin um these yeah these kinds of and and what about it what a, why do they keep why do they hang on why do they matter so much and and you've hit on and you've begun to hit on that as well um and and since you and you brought up the griffin and the phoenix and i definitely want to dig into both of those i'm i'm curious about what makes the griffin hold on for so long and so many different iterations and why we keep being fascinated by it. But I am more disturbed by the Phoenix. I am confused as hell. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh -huh. Like the, like a lot of the other, like a lot of the other fabulous beasts, you could imagine how in on maybe another planet, the thing like that would have evolved like a Griffin, maybe, or even a dragon or a unicorn to some extent. But a phoenix is so idiosyncratic and odd. This this life cycle of this fiery bird who will immolate itself and then rise from its own ashes or leave an egg behind to 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 hatch from the ashes. And, and there's something about the phoenix and this long stretch of time, like living 777 years in some versions of it. And, and in one of your books, you, you bring forth the, um, the apocalypse of Baruch 
And that's the one that really blew my mind. <laughs> I saw that yesterday. I was enthralled. Uh, I was. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and, uh, yeah, let, uh, uh, the angel says, let me show you the mysteries of God or something, which is, gosh, uh, it, it, uh, curls your toenails. <laughs> yeah. And then he wants to know, like, what does the bird eat and what does it excuse? Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and you uh, mentioned the cinnamon uh, over and over. And yeah. this was questions. What, what about uh, cinnamon? Uh, in the medieval um, bestiaries, uh, right behind, uh, next uh, uh, entry after the phoenix uh, is the cinnamon bird. Uh, and uh, now this is in... Uh, also, uh, White's uh, Book of Beasts, which is wonderful. Great classic. First um, uh, English translation uh, of a Latin bestiary. Uh, and it, it's always out in, in different reprints. Uh, and uh, uh, and so that's the one that follows in, in that bestiary and uh, in many, many others. Uh, <coughs> And with cinnamon, cinnamon uh, um, might have been one of the spices uh, that uh, the phoenix uses in the nest. Uh, I, I really would have to look it up again. Um, but uh, cinnamon was, for, and the cinnamon bird was first written about by Aristotle. Uh, and, uh, and it's how the hunters um, uh, tricked the bird. Uh, uh, by let's see, it, it has the nest uh, on a cliff, uh, and oh, and then they hook it. And that's it with hooks and pull it down um, because uh, cinnamon is so uh, so precious, and uh, uh, it's it's a good one. Uh, is it, that it, what it was? It was the. Do you think it was like the preciousness of cinnamon and, and uh, the connection to that of this like that's, transcendent that's, bird or? Yeah, that's that's part of it. Um, <laughs> hey, these animals, uh, as, as in uh, Hero of a Thousand Faces, lead you into very deep forests. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and they keep changing shape. Uh, they keep changing meaning. Uh, and uh, uh, those that I'm interested in most uh, are those that have a very clear. Literary beginning, like the one you mentioned uh, with the Phoenix, which is from Herodotus, uh, a, a passage that is a paragraph long and has influenced the entire tradition of that bird up to Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> uh, with with, um, uh, with with the uh, English uh, lord um, being out there in Tent City uh, saying, uh, hey, uh, this is where the ancient uh, Hohokam uh, uh, lived for centuries uh, and, um, and disappeared. Uh, and uh, we build a new city on this site, and I call that Phoenix. Um, okay, he could not have done that. Uh, or uh, maybe I shouldn't say it that way. Maybe somebody other than Herodotus would have done it the first time. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, you can trace it back uh, to Herodotus. And he is not, uh, or the Phoenix is not, mentioned again uh, in any elaborate form until Ovid about 500 years after Herodotus. <laughs> and on and on and on. It spirals uh, through and uh, takes off into so many different forms uh, and, and is thrilling. It is thrilling to follow uh, the bird uh, as it is uh, for Prince Ivan uh, following the firebird in the Russian uh, fairy tale. Uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's that's a great one. Uh, and he does get a golden feather. 
from that bird, uh, who had been stealing the golden apples of, uh, in, from the garden of the king. And, uh, um, and, and Jung, uh, later says of Michael Mayer, uh, in, in his, uh, he was an alchemist, uh, and, uh, a quest, uh, for the phoenix, uh, and, uh, his figure, uh, an allegorical parallel for an alchemist, uh, uh, young alchemist, um, goes around the world searching for the bird uh, and uh, uh, gets home uh, and then realizes, no, it's not a, a, a one in the outer world, uh, but uh, is now chemical... Uh, uh, climax, uh, for the, uh, for the great work, uh, and, uh, transforming, uh, the prima materia, uh, uh, dirt and everything, uh, in, into spiritual or actual and or actual gold. Uh, and Jung says of, um, Michael Mayer, well, all he had, uh, after that, quest uh, was the pen in his the feather in his hand which, was, <laughs> uh, which is uh, yeah the feather yeah uh, and uh, yeah it's all so exciting I, I can hardly talk <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's 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 sharp that's um and and you're right like your your point that these things not only stay with us but they don't stay the same like they keep changing like although you know you you might have you might be aware of like these you know martial arts uh, dojos or academies where they have like totem animals of like tigers or dragons where i as a youngster i started uh, attending in Indi- evansville indiana the rising phoenix martial arts academy oh there you go <laughs> and uh right. And a br- our brilliant, uh, our brilliant fighting coach and sensei Jeff Westfall, um, I asked him about it one day, like, why the phoenix? Well, you know, why not? Why not some one of these war animals that these other places seem to? And he's like, well, for me, uh, you know, any kind of endeavor that you engage in long enough, you're going to have moments where you start learning and your and your ability and knowledge skyrockets, and then you plateau and even degrade. And then it, you rise from the ashes later on. And so it's, it's not a continuous line. It's more like the flight of a phoenix or the life of a phoenix. Yes. And if you look up, oh, oh, that was wonderful to hear. Uh, if you look up, uh, like the phoenix rising from the ashes, uh, on Google, uh, and, and Notre Dame Cathedral. Hey, it's what six hundred thousand matches or something. Oh that, yeah, yeah. As as it was used um, in the New York City parade, uh, <laughs> great parade. Uh, it gets a million uh, uh, onlookers. Uh, uh, that was right after September eleventh, uh, uh, and they they changed the, the their symbol uh, that year uh, very very quickly, uh, just a matter of a month or something uh, uh, after uh, that uh, horrendous disaster, which has changed the doggone world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it, it has, and uh, and so then people came out as phoenixes, <laughs> uh, and uh, actually there is a wonderful paragraph in the, the Phoenix book somewhere. D- just a second. Okay. Okay. Regarding September 11, 2001. Terrorist bombings of the World Trade Center in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington. Within weeks after the attacks, New York's famed Village Halloween Parade changed its planned theme for an annual festivity. And here's the quote. 
What image, what myth, what spirit can lead us out of darkness towards renewal? The catastrophic events of September 11 left us all suspended in a state of remorse, anger, and powerlessness. At the village Halloween parade, we understood we had to rethink our plans to envision a way to address the tragedy and turn our collective energies toward the healing of New York. We looked for guidance, as the parade has always done, across the span of world cultures and found one mythical creature who since ancient times has always endured destruction to rise again, the phoenix. Halloween night 2001, a gigantic pop, a papier mache Phoenix joined other puppets and about 30,000 costumed participants, many dressed as phoenixes, in a triumphant procession down 6th Avenue, past an estimated 2 million spectators. Smoke rose in the distance from the rubble of what had been the Twin Towers. Parade organizers later said the spectacle was, quote, the first chance many New Yorkers had for a joyous mask gathering post 9-11 and to say to ourselves and the world that we are still alive and kicking. <laughs> wow. That's, and that get, that shoots right at the heart of why do these things matter? I mean, that, that clearly you have a whole, you have a whole city of people that you probably couldn't get to agree on almost anything in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and they all immediately get, this fabulous beast in front of them being this kind of this thing rising up out of all their own minds and their own history into this one transcendent kind of focal point in the Phoenix. That's you said that so beautifully. Dog, dog. <laughs> you, you. <laughs> well, I, um, if you don't mind, I would love to, I would love to hit you, uh, on one more fabulous beast. If I could then, um, because we went from the kind of the, the the you you picked out probably the the best application uh, in modern times of the phoenix as this is this positive um is this positive repository of meaning of 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 rising up and 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 transforming into something better or renewal and so how about let's go dark into the dragon, the dragon, which seems to have, <laughs> it seems to be something vicious and, and chaotic and in need of being fought. Um, and then the thing that burns rather than the thing that rises. And the one thing that's always fascinated me with the dragon is that with very few exceptions, as far as I know, the dragon shows up everywhere. Uh, and all sorts of completely unrelated cultures, um, and throughout time. And, and I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious if you could give us, uh, some insight on, or some, uh, some of your thoughts on what's up with the dragon and why does it show up everywhere? Um, it and- is the most difficult for me to work with. I like it. Of course, it's a dragon and, my gosh, there are millions of them around the world these days. Uh, and, uh, but I can, I am not able to trace it through literature and art, uh, the way, uh, I, I can, uh, the, uh, and have, uh, the, uh, griffin, uh, the phoenix, uh, the unicorn as well. Um, and, I think I won't even try uh, with my own words uh, here, but one that I uh, put in a PowerPoint uh, to, let's see, uh, some museum uh, in Edmonton uh, that no longer exists, the Royal uh, uh, Alberta Museum, uh, talked uh, about uh, dragons up there several years ago. Uh, and, uh, the first PowerPoint I, uh, 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 I, I showed is the meaning of the dragon. And this is from one of your great, great literary heroes. 
And you probably know the line anyway. We are as ignorant <laughs> of the meaning of the dragon as we are of the meaning of the universe. <laughs> that there is something in the dragon's image that appeals to the human imagination. And so we find the dragon in quite distinct places and times. It is, so to speak, a necessary monster. Uh, and uh, Ursula Le Guin says much the same thing uh, about it being necessary. Uh, yeah. Was that Borges? That, that, that's Borges. Yeah. Uh, in the introduction uh, to uh, uh, what book of imaginary, uh, imaginary beings. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but boy, is it hard to work with. Uh, and uh, in, in well, because so much of it comes from oral tradition and then is uh, uh, collected uh, in various uh, versions uh, uh, over uh, uh, such a great amount of time uh, that, wow, uh, th- there have been wonderful books uh, uh, about it uh, and uh, the evolution of the dragon and so on, uh, uh, literary stuff and uh, scholarly stuff and uh, and then, of course, you have all the popular stuff. Oh, my God. Uh, and smog. Wonderful. Magnificent <laughs> smog. Uh, terrific. Um, yeah, I, I know you, you wrote that uh, you would like to talk about dragons. And uh, I, I, where does one start and where does one begin? Uh, <laughs> and because the doggone thing is an Ouroboros uh, with... Uh, uh, the tail uh, in its mouth. Uh, I came up with a little um, poem of my own, uh, oh, f- more than 50 years ago. The day is a dragon, a uh, starry tail in shining mouth. It crawls eternally around the world. And, uh, uh, that's never been printed. <laughs> no. Well, that's beautiful. It should be. <laughs> that's a, uh, it, that's uh, great. Uh, the Ouroboros, uh, yeah, uh, th- that is how I made the map uh, for the how to raise and keep a dragon. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, the the moment you get into dragons, then you oh. then you have to get into serpents, and then you're into the Ouroboros, which which to me is one of the most puzzling but powerful Time. images I think they that can Time. be. Uh, let me check this one second. Where were we? The, uh, yeah, the Ouroboros. And alchemy. Let, let me jump to that uh, for just a minute because that those wonderful comments of yours uh, in Wondrous Birds uh, regarding the eagle at the top uh, of Yggdrasil. Yeah. The, the dragon... Uh, down in the roots uh, of the tree, that is alchemy. It is absolute alchemy, uh, where it goes from the um, uh, the prima materia up to uh, the culmination uh, 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 of you of, of very often the phoenix, phoenix or eagle, um, uh, up at the top uh, and the. Um, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> um, at the, at, you know, the climax of alchemy. About it for uh, y- years and years. And, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought, I hadn't really thought about the the two being kind of the the high and low, the light and dark parallels like that in in terms of alchemy either. But that's exactly right. The philosopher's stone, for goodness' sake. I would be, I would. Be nothing without my books, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> like, oh, come on. Come on, memory. Uh, oh, and that was a wonderful point of yours. Uh, yes, about, um, yeah, the dark and the light and, and so on. Um, yeah, and, and in the Phoenix bo- uh, book, there is that, that chapter on the, uh, the uh, philosophy. Philosopher's Stone, uh, and uh, 
a, a graphic of the uh, of the process, and you go up uh, uh, up to the phoenix at the top. And, um, you probably want to talk more about dragons. That, that, that's fine. But you also asked me about unicorns uh, and. Uh, uh, yeah, the the, uh, the unicorn that that one I haven't I think that's the only one that I haven't touched on in any of my episodes yet because I kind of don't know what to make of it. Every time I dig into it, I get I get into the the medieval stuff, and then I see and then I see the unicorn as Christ, but then I see the unicorn as this like sexual figure as well, and I'm kind of confused by by Some purity. Well. Welcome to the territory. <laughs> yes, of course. You know how it starts. Uh, and this is uh, the uh, the literary beginning. Among the Indians, he proceeds, there are wild asses as large as horses, some being even larger. Their head is of a dark red color, their eyes blue, and the rest of their body white. They have a horn on their forehead, a cubit in length. The filings of this horn, if given in a, po- a potion, are an antidote to poisonous drugs. This horn, for about two palm breaths upwards from the base, is of the purest white, where it tapers to a sharp point in a, of a flaming crimson, and in the middle is black. There are horns. These horns are made into drinking cups, and such as drink from them are attacked neither by convulsions nor by the sacred disease of epilepsy, etc. And, and it goes on to how fast uh, 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 the wild ass runs uh, and so on. Well, that's uh, Cetesius or Cetesius. Uh, and, oh boy, uh, and how do you... Match that uh, with uh, a little pink and uh, blue uh, unicorns uh, on uh, uh, T-shirts and sweatshirts uh, of infants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is why it is so doggone exciting, <laughs> is to follow these uh, these, these forms that, that keep morphing uh, into other things. And how and why? How did it get from uh, the uh, ancient uh, traveler's tale uh, to um, uh, the Bible? It's in the bestiaries uh, as symbol of Christ and and, uh, and so on. And then you have it uh, very famously uh, being killed by hunters uh, in uh, the, uh, the tapestry. Uh, yeah. and, and then the last... Uh, a uh, panel of that uh, is it being very majestic uh, and alive, uh, but with a fence around it. Uh, and uh, what? <laughs> My yeah, next so, so judge is going to be entitled, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, so... I was, you know, I'm, I'm having tr- like at least with at least with something like the phoenix or the dragon, I feel like I can, uh, you know, I can my mind can pin down the overarching kind of or the or the deep roots of it. The the, the dragon being, uh, you know, this 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 hungry, burning uh, force of chaos and, and uh, many other things as well, but at least that and the Phoenix being a, a kind of transcendent rebirth kind of thing. And I can't pin down the unicorn. Is it, is this, well, a, this no. wild freeness? Is it, is it, uh, you're going to have to edit the, this conversation because I know we've run way over. Uh, uh, but okay. If I can wrap it up with the unicorn and the questions that you just asked, um, about what? What is this? <laughs> what is this unicorn? Uh, at this moment, the unicorn sauntered by them with his hands in his pockets. I had the best of it this time, he said to the king, uh, just glancing at him as he passed. A little, a little, the king replied rather nervously. You shouldn't have run him through with your horn, you know. Didn't hurt me, the unicorn said carefully, 
And he was going on when his eye happened to fall upon Alice. He turned around instantly and stood for some time looking at her with an air of the deepest disgust. What is this? He said at last. This is a child, Hagar replied eagerly, coming in front of Alice to introduce her and spreading out both his hands towards her in an Anglo-Saxon attitude. We only found it today. It's as large as life and twice as natural. I always thought they were fabulous monsters, said Unicorn. Is it alive? It can talk, said Hagar solemnly. The unicorn looked dreamily at Alice and said, Talk, child. Alice could not help her lips curling up into a smile as she began. Do you know, I always thought unicorns were fabulous monsters, too. I never saw one alive before. Well, now that we have seen each other, said the unicorn, if you will believe in me, I'll believe in you. Is that a bargain? Yes, if you like, said Alice. <laughs> that's the that's the best possible answer I could get. <laughs> if I don't if I don't understand unicorns, what is a monster? Yeah, what is what, a monster? What uh, in the world you, makes me think they'll understand me? And <laughs> they're wondering the same thing, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and and that's like that wonderful story of yours of, about the the monster the fight uh uh the doppelganger uh yeah. who is the mo- oh god that's a great story that's <laughs> i can see why you have been nominated for the push card prize many times so i really can and uh, uh well, well thank you well thank you for saying so and and i've i've really i've really enjoyed this and and like i said it's been a, it's been a great honor and a great pleasure and and you've been really generous with your time um, I'm I'm curious if um, if we can maybe end off by letting listeners know of where else to find to to follow you and to find more of your works because you had a book come out Sea Monsters not very long ago, right? And so, um, are the, is should we mention that or or any other any other things that you have in store where um, people oh, sure. who are hearing about you can can look you up and get the interested? The fastest way is uh, the website itself, uh, which is uh, the three W's dot uh, josephnig dot com uh, uh, and um, uh, my books are in loads of libraries uh, and online. Uh, there are two. Uh, one's an article from a wonderful art journal in Croatia. Uh, it's called Icon uh, is the name of the journal, I-K-O-N. Uh, and the article, this was back in 2009, I think. Yeah, I think it was 2009. Transformations of the Phoenix from the Church Fathers to the Bestiaries. That's the one. Uh, and the other is a link that I sent you, uh, uh, the Public Domain Review, magnificent collection of, uh, uh, of articles by wonderful writers. Uh, and, and that one is Olus Magnus' uh, Sea Serpent, uh, those two. Uh, and, uh, yes, um, the, you had another question about the Chinese because Sea Monsters, uh, was translated into Chinese and came out a couple of years ago. Yeah, uh, your, your that, books are translated into many, many languages. And, and I've got, as far as I can tell, I've got listeners that, uh, every now and then in say Belgium, uh, Germany, even South Korea. And so if you're, if you're wondering, can I get Joseph Nigg's books in other languages? Yes, you can. All sorts of languages, right? And most recently. Uh, maybe, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I got, uh, a letter, one of the best fan letters I ever have, uh, a couple of years back, and I don't see it in my pile right now. Uh, but I am a reader of yours from China. I love your books. Uh, I, uh, got, um, I, I bought 
the you know, the sea monster book in Chinese. This is the only person I've ever heard of uh, who uh, who purchased that book. It's an actual book that somebody out there bought, for goodness' sake. Uh, and uh, and I uh, also uh, uh, purchased uh, the Phoenix uh, in English. But I wonder when it will be out in Chinese. Uh, and uh, uh, it has been translated. They sent me the whole translation. Uh, and I uh, shared a poem uh, that my friend, uh, 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 Joe Hutchison, uh, current poet laureate of Colorado, uh, wrote for my book. I shared that with him. Uh, and... Uh, in Chinese. It's his first in Chinese. <laughs> uh, far as I know, the book has not, uh, uh, the Phoenix has not come out yet, uh, even though it was contracted, I don't know, what, three years ago or something like that. Last I heard, they uh, had trouble uh, getting uh, permission for the artwork. Well, there wasn't <laughs> but not much artwork in that book uh, because there wasn't room and uh, yeah, anyway, uh, uh, it, it was wonderful to hear from him. And the very, let me leap one second over to the very first, uh, email I got on my business email. And this was, uh, what, 10 years ago, whatever, more than that. Uh, and it was a kid from Portugal, uh, who, um, uh, asked if there were any imaginary animals in Portugal. <laughs> that was so charming. Isn't it? And then, of course, there have been hundreds of uh, letters uh, from kids uh, wanting a dragon because I was silly enough to put uh, addresses in uh, how to raise and keep a dragon. Uh, I... <laughs> That only because the British publisher uh, uh, said, oh, this is not a children's book. This is a uh, an adult spoof of how to raise books, how to raise chickens, uh, hogs, uh, horses. Yeah. Okay, so I will, uh, I'll, I'll go the full route uh, of satire. I'll make up everything. Uh, and... Uh, and oh boy, it has led me into, you know, some moral, uh, struggles. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because they I, want to, they want to raise and keep a dragon. You told them they could do it. <laughs> and the eight year olds, uh, will uh, not uh, be put off. Uh, <laughs> mothers, however, um, uh, have <laughs> really attacked me. Uh, and, uh, one said, uh, <clears throat> My uh, son uh, wrote uh, for a Mashushu uh, uh, dragon uh, uh, in Babylon uh, 10001, <laughs> and that came back. What in the world is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> you would ask the same question. <laughs> Oh, Lordy me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll let you go. Edit as much as you need for goodness. <laughs> or um, maybe we could do a proper uh, uh, interview later that you could use. Uh, no, this one, I, this I one think... goes nowhere. It, it goes nowhere and everywhere. And well, uh, I think it's I think it's wonderful, and I am I've enjoyed the hell out of it, and so I have a good feeling my listeners will as well. And we've hit on and we've hit on a point that that um, you've made in one way or another several times now, which I think is probably the biggest answer to the biggest question I have. Essentially, um, you know, with I think your own books are a great example of this, that in in an era of kind of a whole lot of turmoil and uncertainty and 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 perhaps defined more by division than anything else, what is more unifying and what is more what? both di what's more diverse and unifying than than fabulous beasts? 
and these kind of fabulous monsters that that children from Portugal, adults from China, um, weird guys from me from you know sitting in here in the middle of Illinois, we can all uh, we can all understand a dragon and we get a dragon. We all get sea monsters. Uh, a whole a whole city can come together under a phoenix, and so. There, there is, there is something absolutely meaningful about these things, and and when we need a guide for that meaning, I think there is none better than yourself, sir. So I really appreciate getting to talk with you. Oh boy, you know what I would like, Josh, uh, is that we would collaborate uh, on the uh, fabulous beast thing uh, book uh, uh, with the next edition, with you providing. Uh, the uh, explanations, the questions, and the you know the commentary. Uh, God, you do wonderfully. Uh, and, well, that's uh, uh, you don't have to ask me twice. That's an automatic yes. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. Okay, if we ever have a chance, if we ever have a chance, you're you're on, kid. You're <laughs> Fantastic. Sign me up. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been a real hoot. Uh, thank you. Uh, really made my day. Well, I think uh, w- one final time, thank you again so much, sir. It's been a, <laughs> it's been a great honor and a great pleasure. 